Hi everyone, this is Andrew Quitmire from Georgia Tech's Biotracking Lab, the multi-agent robotics and systems laboratory. And right now I'm going to show you more parts about how to use our software pack. And this will focus on the actually using the multi-track software. So the multi-track software is basically software for finding the positions and orientations of multiple agents running around in your uh, video that you want to track. Um, so you can do unlimited number of different critters, um, doesn't have to be ants, and it's basically based on having uh, three core files. Um, you need a video file, a background. The video file is what you're going to track, um, so it's your raw video. You need a background file. You can see how to make a background in previous of these videos. You can use our handy dandy backgrounder app. Um, and then you need a model file. The model file is basically a two dimensional shape of what your target looks like so that it can look for and hunt for this shape when it's doing the actual tracking. Um, and the mask file we'll discuss later, but it's totally optional. Um, so, Let's start from the very beginning. Um, you'll have your BioTrack pack. You'll unzip it, uh, and you'll choose the appropriate software. Um, if you have a 64-bit machine, choose Multitrack 64. If you have um, a regular machine, choose just regular Multitrack. Uh, we have 64-bit, uh, so we can use that. Um, Double-click it. It should open. Now, your very first time that you're going to use it, um, it's probably going to be angry at you. Um, this is because it doesn't have what is necessary to run. It doesn't have a video file, it doesn't have a background file, and it doesn't have the model file. You can see it says none selected on all of them. So, to remedy this, um, the probably quickest way to get going is look in some of our sample video that we got going for you, uh, that we've included for you. Um, so we're going to go to, well actually let's look at this sample video folder real quick. Uh, we have some abstract calibration ones. We have a short video clip with many ants, um, short clip with just one single bee, and then a short clip with just two ants walking around. Um, so let's start with uh, the two ants video. And you'll notice we have our core um, pieces of the puzzle here. We have a video. Um, I can even open this up. And it shows two ants. One ant walks up, grooms itself and then she runs away. Um, very simple video. One ant over here, another ant over there. Um, and this is from Arizona State University, um, who's very cool and shot a beautiful video. Um, Stephen Pratt's lab. And so um, then we also have a model of what an ant looks like. And we can show you how to make models later, but basically this should be the full resolution um, image of what the um, the shape of those um, targets. Uh, so that's what that looks like. And then we have a background file, uh, which you can learn about how to make in the background with the Backgrounder app. Um, but basically, this is that entire video sans ants. There's no ants here. So the way that most tracking problems, uh, computer vision really works, is it takes your original video, remember with the ants running around, and it does basically a subtraction where it takes every pixel and it looks and sees, um, okay, this pixel um, from the original video minus the pixel in the background video or in the background image um, is, does it equal zero? Um, if it's zero, they were probably the same thing. If um, you take this pixel versus the pixel where the ant's standing, you have a very blue pixel and then you have a very dark brown pixel. And so you're going to get much more of a difference. And so that's how it knows that something is different there. Um, that's sort of the fundamental basis of most computer vision. Anyway, enough of that. You have your three core components, um, ant video, model video, um, and backgrounder. And so the quickest way to get going is Multitrack has a handy dandy settings thing. Um, certain versions of Ubuntu only show you these options if you scroll up there, so this can be handy. So if you go to settings, load settings, and then go into your sample video folder. Um, we wanted this 
to ants video and you'll notice there was a fourth object in there a settings file so this settings file will actually store um, and reload uh, your settings once you get your tracker appropriately tuned so we open this up um, now it says oh ready to track this is great um, so it has our video um, it has our background and it has our model loaded again we're not using a mask in this particular application uh, so it just says uh, none selected optional if for some reason you accidentally go in there and you choose oh let's add another background um, and then you have a mask file but you're like oh I didn't want that if you just load the mask and hit cancel um, it will remove the mask for you um, so now once you're all set and everything's green and happy it will go to the tracking uh, controls automatically for you um, and it should have uh, because all, all these initialization settings should have decent um, uh, settings for tracking so in theory this should just work when I hit play da -da -da. so you'll notice we um, the first factor is the analysis resolution which is at one half so this is a uh, quite high resolution uh, when you're thinking about real-time visual analysis. Da -da -da. So, if we want this to go, you can see it's located where the target is, right there. Um, this new ant's coming in, but it's going very slowly. So if we want this to go speeding up or something, uh, we can increase uh, what we divide our analysis by um, and this will speed up our video so you can see now I have two targets detected beautiful the models are sticking right on them and we can uh, they're being tracked with their orientation um, and their positions uh, which is super handy so this ant pauses it rotates a little bit and our tracker is sticking right on there. Again, one fourth resolution is still quite uh, high resolution. If uh, for some reason uh, you wanted this to go really quickly, um, which can be useful for when you're just initially setting it up, uh, I recommend bumping it up to even uh, higher divisors and you can see the tracker running in even faster time. So this video is very short because it's for demo purposes. Um, but so here you can see the tracker running much more quickly. I'm um, just using a lower resolution. Um, so that's the first um, factor to know about, the analysis resolution. All this does is it takes your entire video and all your trackers and it scales it. Um, right now I have this set at uh, fit to window mode, uh, but let's go to 100%. So this is the size, this is a 1080p video so when we're normally tracking and we go down to um, if we were tracking at one to one um, instead of one to four we would be um, analyzing pixels that are um, this a series of pixels about this big um, which can be overkill for some applications if you just want to know where your guys are um, or gals um, then you can just choose that if um, you need much more precise measurements and the ants come much closer or interact a lot more or there are many many more ants and they're much smaller you'll need all the resolution you can get and so then you're gonna have to deal with a much slower tracking problem but um, you'll get more precision by going to lower and lower or higher and higher resolutions lower and lower scaling factors um, so now the next thing to kind of uh, teach you about uh, is kind of these visualization options that help you tune your tracking program. So first there's, um, I'm just going to turn them all off so we can look at them one by one. Da -da -da. Um, yeah, we'll turn that off and we'll turn this off. Okay, so I'm just going to restart. Um, the tracking. Okay. So we're at third resolution. 
The first thing to look at, and remember, we don't see any, it doesn't look like it's tracking because I turned off all of my visualization options. Um, the very first thing to look at to help you tune your tracker is the background subtraction threshold. And you just click there to visualize this. Ah, and so now you can see what the computer sees. So you remember how we loaded a video file and we loaded a background file. Well, what it's doing, and as I mentioned earlier, is it just simply takes, it subtracts the video from that background. Um, so now you see everywhere where there is a very large, and then it does a threshold on it, um, and that's what you're setting right here. Um, so everywhere there's a very large difference um, between the foreground and background, it comes up as white. Everywhere there's not much of a difference, uh, it ends up as black. White is what we tend to think of as detections. Um, so I'm going to just make this a little bit uh, lower resolution since I'm recording. I'm going to make this a bit faster for you. Um, so if I zoom all the way back out, fit to window, um, you'll see, okay, this is how the computer vision kind of sees the world. You have an ant there, you have another ant there, maybe you have ants over here where there's these other little dots. Um, but that's what it's here to try to figure out. What your goal is in setting the background subtraction threshold is you want to make, um, you want to uh, increase this as far as you can to where these still look like ants. So right now the ants have tiny shadows because we don't have our threshold high enough. We're getting a lot of this center ring because we don't have our threshold high enough. Um, so we want to bump this threshold up to the very limit of where we have still um, objects, detections, that look like ants. Um, the higher your threshold is, the faster your problem will run too because in theory you'll have fewer detections. Um, so if we crank it all the way up there, though, we're not going to be able to track anything because um, there are no pixels shown. So it's usually good to um, maybe even start from the top and work your way down uh, until you have something that looks barely like ants and there's not too much noise. Um, so we still have some noise there. So we can decrease this just by bumping this up. And then we don't want to eat away at the ants too much. So that's looking pretty good. And you can check it out at even higher resolutions. Oh, it looks a lot better. Um, I'll even zoom in. We'll get a closer look again at that one ant that's feeding. So this is nice. Um, you have pretty much full ant shape. There's minimal uh, extra noise going on. Uh, this seems like a decent setting for this background subtraction. You might want to bump it just, just a little bit. Ah, oh, perfect. Now we can see it's antennae a little bit. Beautiful. So now, okay, that's set. Da -da -da. The next thing uh, we're going to want to do is I'm going to show you um, just one of these things. Uh, the model. So this option simply overlays the model. So now we can see how it's fitting uh, where it thinks the ant is over the actual ant. Um, so all the green pixels you see are the model. All the white pixels are where it's trying to detect. Again, we can turn the background subtraction threshold off. Uh, and we can see it overlaid in the original video. We can come over to our stationary ant, which is very nice for us. Um, and we can see uh, with this model highlighted, it's overlaying the model image. So um, when I'm tuning, I still tend to switch to the uh, subtraction view uh, because it becomes a bit clear what you're doing. Uh, but you can go back and forth pretty easily. Da -da -da. Now the next threshold to set is the model to data threshold. So what this does is it um, it basically um, determines how much white pixels you need for it to really consider that to be a potential track. Um, so right now I have around 50% um, selected. Um, and that means that 
of the amount of pixels and at this one-third resolution you can see the individual pixels of the model so the green so let's say this model has 500 pixels inside of it um, how many detections it needs to see in this area um, detections being the white pixels for it to consider putting a track on there so do you remember when we had uh, when we still had a lot of noise um, every time it sees any kind of white pixel um, even if it's you know over here or just a floating white pixel it considers putting this model on top of those white pixels if there's not enough data there and it doesn't line up correctly enough then it will remove those pixels um, based on this model data threshold so in general you want this as high as you can get it um, because it'll reduce the impact of noise upon your tracking so we'll keep it uh, around 80 90 percent or something like that um, if your tracks aren't going on to your um, animals quick enough um, if, if it's uh, trying not to do that or something uh, decrease your model data threshold um, if you're picking up uh, models on too many false errors um, increase it that's pretty much how it works um, usually you don't have to mess with this too much um, okay so the next uh, feature that we will look at is I'm gonna bump up the subtraction a bit more um, the next feature is the track search distance and we will visualize this um, so you can see this is just a handy dandy little circle around our ant this is remember when I was talking about how it looks for all those detections this is whenever um, it finds a detection how far around a model it will look it will hunt for possible detection pixels um, so if your ants move very slowly um, such as this uh, which ant is not moving anywhere um, we can decrease this track search distance very small um, and it'll still probably find where the actual ant set of detection pixels is located um, but if it's located if we shrink it too much um, it might not ever find them uh, also this is a problem with the model data threshold it was too high for it to get born so when tracks get um, born ah now it popped on um, for tracks to get born actually takes even more um, of a good tracking uh, than for them to just keep following a certain set of detections um, and so you can see this ant's not going anywhere we can change how far away or how close by um, the ant uh, will hypothetically move Ta -da -da. So go to fit to window um, so you can see it's looking this model right here is looking all around here for where this ant could move from one frame to the other it's doing a very good job of finding this ant because this ants not really moving um, if you have an ant that's going very fast or let's say a bee which I'll show you in a bit um, it um, you might run into problems and you might have to increase this track search distance okay but in general the smallest you can have it uh, the more quickly uh, your tracking will run and the uh, less track stealing you will tend to get because um, if this ant passes by the other ant uh, as we can see it may do da -da -da. Um, it could try to jump onto this set of detections before another model claims it as their own when this track when this ant is just emerging um, so then um, the next thing to do uh, is set your lost track life if you have very noisy or crazy data uh, which here we have very very decent uh, beautiful data um, your uh, ant may um, disappear momentarily or let's say a hand waves in front of the um, screen and suddenly all these ants disappear doesn't know where they are the models get confused um, 
This uh, determines how long it should keep a model sitting in place after it's already lost where its detections are. These models are bright green because they have plenty of detections to work with. But if I, um, if I fake that we lost the tracks by increasing the subtraction threshold, you'll see that the, um, they turned red and then they disappeared after only 10 frames. Um, and this is because we set our lost track life to 10 frames. So if I, up, oh, see, they got unhealthy and then they died. Um, if we want uh, these models to stick around longer after some sort of cat c catastrophe happens like that, uh, we can increase this lost track life. So now I'm gonna crank it up to 100 frames. So now, we have one model situated there. We have another model sitting over here. And we're going to increase this threshold to fake like our ants disappeared. And now you'll see that our models are just sitting there um, and they're kind of dead. And it takes them 99 frames uh, before they actually disappear. So this is very helpful if you have very low resolution video or very noisy video and your animals keep disappearing on you. In general though, uh, I tend to keep it quite low uh, just because I don't want my, um, I don't, if the ants disappear, it means they were supposed to have disappeared. Um, so cool. So that's lost track life. The only other thing uh, you need to think about is the separation threshold. Um, so what this does is, we'll get a nice We'll go back to the zoomed in view. Is it, whenever a model, um, the green, is associated with a group of detections, the white, um, it places the model on top of them in what it assumes to be the correct orientation. Um, then the model um, does it claims this set of detections as its own. And the way that it claims it is it basically removes all those detections from the group. And this makes it so that you don't end up putting another model on the exact same ant. Um, and so you can see how it removes all of those uh, detections by visualizing the separation threshold. So from every one of these pixels in the model, it goes out a certain radius and basically deletes any data that's below that. Um, if we increase or decrease the separation threshold, then you will see these little dots. Um, let me crank this down a bit. Um, then you will see these concentric circles um, starting to shrink. In general, you just need this just a couple pixels big. Um, this means that you could have two ants that are very close to each other um, because the model only deletes the um, areas of detected pixels around here. But uh, sometimes you want it to be a lot larger um, in case you're run encountering problems with your track drifting over to steal the track of a neighboring set of detections. Um, sometimes you want it smaller if your ants walk towards each other, um, but uh, the models start uh, drifting apart. I can kind of maybe show you an example of that later. Um, but in general, uh, shrink it to where it looks decent. And really the key to all of this is um, play around with it until the tracks look like they're fitting nicely. Um, which brings up the most important thing and feature probably of this is so once you have all of these um, beautiful features set and tuned you need to go to your settings and you simply go to save settings and then you give it a good name like um, my project name uh, and you save it in the folder with wherever you're keeping uh, the rest of your um, collection uh, for this project. So we have this mini ants project. Um, 
we're going to save it as my project name dot any. Um, so now I can go and I can change things and I oh I screwed this up and I changed this a lot and I made this real big and then I reset it and the next time I use the tracker I'm like oh no what's happening uh, nothing's working I just see a blank screen I've forgotten what all the buttons do um, what can I do well what you can do is you can simply go up to settings load settings you can find your old um, uh, video from the that you can find your own settings file that you just saved demo buy a trick pack sample video uh, many ants oh no this was single or which one did I <laughs> I saved it in the many ants one but anyway you see my project name dot any um, any is a kind of initialization format file standard thing uh, oh look it works again beautiful um, so the good thing to remember is if you have things the way you want them, go up settings, save settings. It's great. Um, if you have things screwed up, um, you've deleted all your files, you even deleted the, the settings files that came with um, your BioTrack pack in the sample video, um, you can <laughs> simply go to settings, uh, load defaults. Um, and this will give you some sort of default um, characteristics that have a decent chance of working on your video. So worst comes to worst, go to settings, load defaults. And if you want to save them, save settings. That's probably the most important part. A um, couple other things to show you real quick uh, before I finish this ramble. Um, you can go to... Uh, there's a couple more options down here. There's contour tracking, uh, which is quite experimental at this point. Um, what it does is it really works best on higher resolution video. And if your um, objects have a strong outline, um, it will try to fit, it'll try to match just the outlines of your um, object and detection together. Da, da, da. So there you can see it's not doing the best job, but it's going a lot more quickly. Um, and so that was kind of the idea behind testing out this contour tracking. May or may not work for you, probably won't work for you. I wouldn't really recommend um, using it at this point. Um, but if you want to play with it, there it is. Just remember to turn it off if things are breaking or going weird. Um, that's an experimental feature. The other thing is if you want to be a really big power user. Da, da, da. One second. Okay. My resolution went too high while I was recording this video and also running another version. Um, but um, yeah, so we'll actually run this one for now. Um, there is, uh, so here's a sample of it tracking uh, lots of little ants. Um, the other advanced feature um, is something called this ICP registration. This is actually how it determines how to match the model with the uh, set of detections. Uh, and it has some parameters, um, most of which you really don't need to mess with. Um, but if you really, oh, I really want to play with some sort of uh, thing, you the best, the first thing to start with would be the iterations. So while it's laying the model on top of your set of detections, um, we'll visualize these again. So we're really low resolution, so that's what your detections look like. Uh, we can crank up this resolution to get something that looks a bit more ant-like. But you can see it still works pretty well on things that don't even look very ant-like. So you can see how that started in one orientation, then rotated to turn around. Um, but right now it's still even like kind of dragging. That's mostly because we're at a really low resolution. Um, but this can be uh, changed through this uh, ICP max iterations thing. This is how many um, iterations it goes through when trying to best align the model with the detection. So if we crank this down to one, um, and we reset this, 
we're going to see that our models will probably go on to these. They may even look somewhat okay at some parts, but you'll see it's kind of dragging behind this set of detections. That's because it's not doing much processing to a line. This makes uh, your program or your tracking run slightly faster um, to set this lower, but you get much worse results. So if your tracks aren't sticking that well, um, you might want to increase this to let's say 10. Um, so now suddenly the the tracks are starting to align themselves more properly. Um, usually a hundred seems to be very nice. Um, and doesn't use that much more processing, but you can see things are aligning themselves a bit more better. Uh, you can even crank this up to maybe even a thousand um, if you want it to really um, try to do the best job it can at uh, sticking the detections to your, uh, sticking the model to your detections. Um, okay, so that's pretty much the parameters. Um, the next, the basically the last thing you're going to want to know about is you have all this beautiful track data, correct? Um, what should you do with it? Um, well, you probably want to save it somewhere. So what you're going to do is you go back to files, you select the folder where you want to save this um, sample video, um, the tracking data, you want to save the tracking data. Go to demo. Um, we're going to toss it in our sample videos folder. This was the many ants project. And we're going to save our tracking data. That's the set of all of these ant IDs, um, their positions, and their orientations at given times. And we're going to save them in a format called uh, BTF, uh, which I will show you real quick. So uh, we're going to go here. This is the folder we want to save it into the, with the rest of the project, Many Ants. And we're going to give this project a name, um, Many Ants Demo Tracking. Okay, then we just hit Save BTF. It goes, done saving BTF data for project Many Ants Demo Tracking. Cool, that's great to know. Um, now, if we go over into this folder, we will see that in our sample video, we now have a folder um, called Many Ants Demo Tracking. If we look inside of it, we see all these different files. So this is the, how BTF data is stored. You have a set of IDs. So this is just a, a line, or a bunch of numbers separated by line value, um, separated by new lines. As you can see, it's a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And you have a set of, these are all compared to a set of timestamps. So it reads from the very first line of the ID, and it reads from the very first line of the timestamp, and it goes, okay, at time 66 milliseconds, there was um, an ant with ID somewhere in the image. Where was that ant in the image? Oh, it was over at this X location, um, and it was over at this Y location. And T is actually the angle of the ant in radians. So you can use that uh, for your purposes also. There's also a timestamp, uh, a BTF file, where it records the timestamp in frames if you find that more convenient than recording the timestamp as uh, or receiving the timestamp as milliseconds. So again, quick overview. This is how multi-track works. You load in a video, load in a background file, load in a model file, um, mask file. Uh, I'll show you that in one more second. We'll just finish this overview. And you want to make your analysis resolution uh, to a comfortable level. The higher, the better. Um, but you might want to set your analysis a bit, your resolution a bit lower, um, tune all the parameters, and then crank it back down. Uh, that might help you a little bit. Uh, then you can crank your resolution back really high and uh, just let your thing slowly chug and get the best tracks it can get. So right now it's going pretty fast, but let's make this all the way down to half resolution and it's going to go chunk, 
chunk, chunk. Um, it'll probably go faster on your computer because it won't be a laptop that's also running several other programs and um, capturing the screen at the same time. But if you can get it going to about this state, just leave it on uh, for you know 20 minutes or so, you can get uh, probably the best quality uh, tracking that you can. Um, so then uh, save your settings. Once you get your settings appropriately good, um, go into your files, uh, save your data somewhere. Okay, yeah, this is the same folder I wanted, but let's say this was a new style of tracking. So with new settings, new settings, um, you can save an additional quantity of BTF data. Uh, so now we have mini ants demo tracking new settings, mini ant demo. Um, so that all works. Um, now for the very last thing to show you about the mask. Um, so this file actually uses a mask and that's because if you look at Da, da, da. Let me crank this a bit higher. If you look at this arena, we have reflective sides. Um, so there's an ant that shows up in the shadows over here. There's an ant that shows up in this kind of reflection over here. So that isn't part of what we want to consider in our tracking. So that's why we create this mask file. Um, and this is very simple and easy to do. Um, so we load it in this mask. Uh, the mask file looks like uh, this. Um, we chose the correct mask file. Da -da -da. And where is that mask file? Da -da -da. Here's a closer view of what this mask looks like. Um, it is a set of white pixels for where you want to think about doing your tracking and it's a set of black pixels for where you don't want to do your tracking. Uh, these are very easy to make. Um, what you can do is you can go to your da -da -da, your uh, video, you find your background, you get um, the basically free open source equivalent of Photoshop, GIMP and you drag your background file into that. Da, da, da. Oh, do I drag it into, drag it into GIMP. Okay, it opens it up. Then what you can do is really paint on top of this. Uh, so we find our paintbrush and we set our color to black and then we're going to make our brush very big and we basically paint black whatever you don't want to detect da, da, da. so I don't want to look at any of this stuff along the edges um, paint all that black and then uh, you want to fill in the rest of the area with white. So again, you can paint it, um, or you can uh, do the selection tool, uh, change how it works. Uh, but anyway, make yourself a black and white uh, image. Ah, select none. Ah. Um, that has white wherever you want it and black wherever you don't want to even consider those pixels for tracking. Once you have that exactly how you would like it, da, da, da. I'm just gonna go quickly for you, blah, blah, blah. Um, imagine all this interior is white, the other one. File, save as, and then just make this your uh, mask um, PNG, or it's already a PNG. Make it your mask, uh, mask two, since we already have one. Save it. Save it. Great, save as a PNG. Um, everything in these tracking programs gets written in as PNGs. Um, 
then you will see you have your new mask. Again, I just scribbled all over it. It should look like something like this, uh, where once again, white is detections. That's where detections can happen. Black is where you want to black out everything. You don't want the tracker to even look at those pixels. Um, that can be very helpful if there's something happening on the edge, um, if you have hands moving by, um, if the lighting's changing weirdly on the side of your arena, and you just don't want to even consider those detections. Um, so you can even see what this would look like without the mask. Um, so I can cancel loading this mask and the program will still run fine. But if we look at the, um, the background subtraction and we crank it down a bit, you can see you get these reflections in the sides of the arena and we want to kind of minimize that. So again, that's the reason you make your mask. Uh, that should be a pretty extensive overview of how to use this tracking program. I hope it helps you. Uh, and once again, feel free to distribute or use this software as you see fit. It's all um, totally open source. Um, feel free to try to develop with us if you want. Um, and I hope it helps you guys. And if you have questions, please contact us on our discussion.